Today we're taking a look at the Nav Atlas family of radios for your UTV. When you're looking for a radio or in-car communication system for your UTV, there's really only two names in the off-road industry that you hear about day-to-day -day from people online. Today we're taking a look at the Nav Atlas uh, family of radios, which is a new brand that you may not have heard of. Um, I reached out to these guys a number of months back about possibly reviewing some of their products and they were kind enough and generous enough to send us a complete kit for our XP Turbo. Uh, we have a NCR2 car-to-car uh, -car radio system. We have the NNT in-car communication system. We have the NB200 headsets. We have the NHR1 uh, handheld mobile radios. We have the NH100 in-helmet headset kit. We also have the ANT101 um, antenna kit. So before we get too far along into this, it's important that you know these products were sent to us uh, by Nav Atlas. Uh, we do get to keep the products. We did not get money from Nav Atlas and they have no input on this review, the editorial process, or what you're about to see in this video. So uh, please know that our opinions are our own. Uh, we do not sell those to our sponsors. And everything you're about to hear is honest, uh, truthful, and everything that uh, we expect in a review. So let's jump right in. First, let's talk about the NCR2 mobile radio. This is a car-to-car -car mobile radio system. Uh, Nav Atlas has this listed at a 20 watt radio. Uh, it comes with the head unit itself and a handheld microphone, speaker, and keypad combination. Uh, it's secured to the front of the radio via a RJ45 um, network connection, uh, and that carries eight pins of uh, transmission and uh, reception to the handset. The handset does have a magnet on the back of it that will connect it to the faceplate or some sort of metal object in your car, uh, but it's not really powerful enough to hold it while you're riding. So um, I highly suggest getting some Velcro uh, to adhere this to your dash somewhere. The back of the radio does come with a inline glass barrel fuse. Uh, this is not preferable for off-road use, but uh, that's what's included here. Uh, there's also an additional two glass barrel uh, fuses later on down the wiring harness near the battery. So on both the negative and positive sides, you'll have a glass 20 amp uh, fuse down there. And then you have this uh, smaller uh, amperage fuse near the unit on the positive side. So theoretically, if there's a problem with the head unit, it's going to take it out here. If there's a bigger issue where maybe your antenna gets hit by lightning or some sort of electrical malfunction, um, it would travel down further to the battery and then pop those fuses there. Unfortunately, those glass barrel fuses will be behind your um, behind some of the plastic buried underneath your car. Uh, most batteries are not easily accessible on these UTVs and those glass barrel fuses being located s deep underneath those plastics would be a bear to change out. So um, I would highly recommend that if you order this radio, you replace those with an inline blade style fuse up near the dash where you can access it. The NCR2 radio is capable of transmitting in the uh, 136 to 174 megahertz range, which is your uh, VHF range. Uh, it also operates in the 400 to 480 megahertz UHF range. So VHF is great for getting out further in the distances uh, in wide open desert areas, those types of scenarios. And the UHF uh, is better in more obstacle um, based environments like maybe on trail um, in the mountains um, or where there may be buildings involved, things like that. That doesn't mean it can transmit on all those frequencies. It just means that it's capable of those frequencies. The FCC regulations require that all radios uh, operate within a certain licensed band group. And you'll notice that if you order a competitor radio or these radios, uh, they have a number of presets already established in the radios and channels, and they operate in ranges like 151 or others. And those are actually licensed channels. Those are actually submitted by them to the FCC, authorized and licensed to them to resell in their products and then to you. You still have to be licensed to operate this radio. The extension of that license from the FCC goes from the manufacturer to you at that point. 
So these radios can operate on most of the frequencies that you find on most aftermarket radio systems, uh, whether that be like a rugged, a PCI, a Bofang, whatever. Uh, this will be interoperate with all of those. Next, we have the NNT10 uh, in-car communications intercom. Uh, there's also an NNT20 version of that, which is wider and shorter, uh, but it's essentially the same product from everything I can tell on the information online. Uh, the NNT10 radio has two ports in the front, a Vox uh, sensitivity knob, a volume knob, um, 3.5 millimeter stereo uh, music input jack, uh, and then it also has a 3.5 TRRS cell phone connection for making and receiving calls. Uh, there's no Bluetooth functionality, there's no connectivity uh, interruption uh, between your phone, but there is uh, the analog audio back and forth. The back of the NCR2 radio has a simple RG8 connection for your antenna, along with the power connection that we've mentioned. Uh, the back of the NNT10 does have a number of different ports um, that you'll see here. Uh, first, we have the driver and co-driver headset jacks, along with uh, the push to talk uh, jacks. You have an aux jack and an extension jack, both of which are not really well defined in any literature from Nav Atlas. You have a crew one and a crew two, which is your headset extension to a third and fourth passenger if you have a four-seater vehicle. Uh, they do not have a push-to-talk option. They are observers of the conversation only and do not participate, uh, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, a lot of times if you have kids in the back, uh, you want to hear them talk, give their opinion, let you know that they have to go to the bathroom, stuff like that. The back of the NNT10 uh, also has a radio uh, connection that's hardwired to the back of it. Uh, this essentially is um, for most points, going to be used with a car to car comm. Uh, this connects to the main car to car radio via an adapter cable. Uh, this is your standard uh, two pin, 2.5, 3.5 uh, audio interface jack, and then that connects to your NNT10. The odd thing is that this connects to the mobile radio. So normally on, on competitor radios, you have a, a, a solid connection, a weather uh, resistant connection that plugs directly into the back. On these ones, uh, this is more generic. And so there's an actual flap right here on the side of the radio that you'll need to remove before you mount it to any kind of mounting plate uh, to make way for um, this adapter. So as you can see, this adapter is not small, it's, it's more or less made for a universal application. Uh, so this will be a bunch of bulk that's added to the radio uh, when you're installing it. You cannot remove this flap once it's installed on the, on the bracket, you will need to take that out first. So all in all, um, kind of a generic setup, it's not really custom uh, to the off-road scene, it's just more of a uh, more generic setup um, from Nav Atlas, which is fine as long as it works. Next, we have the NB200 headset. Uh, this is a really good looking headset. It's uh, been hydro dipped with a carbon fiber graphic. Looks really nice. Uh, everything's black. There is a spring metal along the back that keeps the tension on the ear cups, but keeps the weight of the metal down low. That also carries the cable uh, from one cup to the other. You have a strap with Velcro on top to adjust for your head size and keep things comfortable. Um, and a boom arm that extends out with a microphone uh, to speak into. Uh, this is very similar to other competitors on the market, um, and it's actually fairly well built. Um, I didn't have any problems with it as far as functionality, build quality, any of that stuff. Um, and uh, so should be pretty typical to any other system that you may have used. The tension on this is a little tight, but that's really kind of what you want in off-road when you're bouncing around, you want it to stay on your ears. Um, so if you're sensitive to pressure, you know, maybe an in-helmet system might be more your style. Um, if you have a pumper helmet, things like that, you can buy the NH100 that has the two earpieces, the boom mic, and the connection to go to your units. Between both of these units, uh, the audio quality was great. I didn't really find any big deterrence there. The ear cups on the 200s are way better than the ones on the 100. That's expected. Um, you obviously have better acoustics with a headset than you do uh, two little headphone styles that go inside your helmet. The microphones both worked just fine. The boom stayed where they needed to be. They're nice and stiff. They don't fall off, fall down, whatever. The headphones uh, on the 200s uh, are a very flat profile. There's no big bass boost. There's no treble uh, boost. There's none of that stuff. There's no big scooping in the audio. Uh, so it's pretty flat. But when we're talking about communications, you kind of want that. You want that mid-range to be what's focused on. Um, and this unit will do that. 
Next up, we have the NHR1, and that is your handheld unit. That is a dual band radio, just like the NCR2. Uh, it's rated at five watts, um, and it's actually a pretty handsome unit. Feels good in the hand, it's pretty uh, hefty. It's not heavy, but it's substantial enough that it feels like it's good quality. It has a decent battery, and the lifespan of the operating unit is um, pretty well defined and comparable with other radios on the market. And then with the in-car unit and package system that you get, you also get the NT101. Um, antenna. This is listed as a whip type antenna, so if you see it in literature, uh, please know it is not a whip. As I even did that right there, I could hear it creaking. Um, this is not a antenna you want to be taking to the trees. Uh, there's obviously no customization on this antenna uh, to tune to a frequency. Um, and there's also no way to wrench on this to make it a nice, tight, secure connection on your radio antenna mount. Uh, so you will have to use your hand strength or uh, mar up the surface with some pliers to get that nice and tight. I'd highly recommend buying an antenna spring for this as it is not flexible and will probably end up breaking um, as soon as you hit something out on the trail. Let's talk about installation. Uh, installation is pretty straightforward. You have a number of wires that are provided from Nav Atlas to run from the back of the unit to your battery. Uh, again, I talked about the NCR2 having glass barrel fuses on that harness. Uh, I do not recommend those. I do not like those. Even the ones that we received, uh, the caps on those were falling off and were corroded. So um, I highly recommend replacing those with blades if you use it. Uh, NNT10 did have a blade style fuse on the back. Uh, that's great, and I didn't have any problems with that. Running the cables directly to the battery is always preferred for a mains radio. Uh, it reduces electrical interference and noise that you might have um, observed if you've ever been in someone's car with incoms that you've heard the whine of the motor as they rev. Uh, one of the reasons that happens is you do not have a direct connection to the battery. You're running through you know, a bus bar or something like that that, that is getting uh, grounded out to uh, the rest of the motor. So we ran our uh, power cable down the, down the center channel on the XP Turbo, just like most Razor owners would do. Uh, we avoided running them parallel with other cables and ran them on the opposite side of that chase uh, just to make sure there was no interference issues there. Uh, those then went directly to a bar to the mains on the battery. Uh, as always, we run a full throttle battery. Uh, if you don't have an aftermarket battery for your car, I highly uh, suggest buying a full throttle AGM battery. It'll give you almost twice the amount of amp hours. Uh, it'll be a deep cycle. It'll start every time that you need it to, so highly recommended. Uh, wiring the NNT10, uh, we connected it to our in-car switching system, which is a uh, Rear Light Bar Pro 8 system. Uh, and what that is, is a digital uh, switching unit on the dash, but then it's connected to a circuit board that has actual analog relays um, and fuses, uh, just like if you would manually wire that up yourself. The mains radio doesn't have any draw when it's uh, going, so there's no problem having it run straight to the battery. It's not gonna trickle, uh, sap your battery dry. Installing these two units into the bracket is pretty straightforward. Uh, they supply screws for you to simply mount onto the arms. On this side, you can see there's only one mount point. On the opposite side, uh, there's actually three mount points, uh, two for uh, the in-car comms, one for the radio. As you can see, the radio here is very short. It's very shallow. Um, it's not very tall and it's fairly uh, small width. So it'd be actually be able to mount anywhere in your vehicle, any custom spot that you might have. If you have a custom dash, things like that, there shouldn't be any problem finding a place for that. The uh, NNT10 is definitely more substantial in length. Um, and like I said, there's the 20 version of it that has more width, but less height. Um, but I, would, I believe it's also the same depth. So uh, there's different options for your application. Uh, this bracket's specifically made to replace the cubby in the center console of the XP Turbo and XP Razors. Uh, it simply mounts to, you take the cubby out, and then there's four self-tapping screws that you go through the bottom and the top, um, and it just basically fits right into the, where the cubby used to be. Everything on installation, pretty straightforward, nothing really complicated. Um, it was fairly simple and uh, anyone can do it. Uh, now let's talk about our experience with this system. As you can tell, I've kind of gone quickly through all the specs and all the products and things like that. I don't wanna really spend a whole lot of time detailing them individually, um, each individual little spec, things like that. You can visit our website, sidebysideguys.com to read in a full in-depth written review of all of these components. 
uh, with pictures and samples and things like that. Um, so I highly recommend you check that out. Our first experience with this system uh, was to get it installed, go through the menus, make sure everything's working, check it out, learn the different features of it and whatnot. You know, with the, t the buttons being on the top of the NCR2 and the dash of the Razer coming down kind of like this, you can't really read these buttons. And so getting familiar with these before you install it would be highly advised um, as you basically have to guess what you're uh, poking at um, under the dash. On the front, you have a push to talk button. You have a selection wheel here that you can also push to confirm uh, options on the screen. The screen is a nice bright backlit LCD screen, uh, easy to read, shows both dual band options um, if you're monitoring two different channels. And this handset easily connects with the RJ45. So this is kind of where the first issues popped up with this product. The first thing I wanted to do was to make sure that we were getting transmission out of the antenna, that we were able to both transmit and receive audio, um, and it wasn't working. Didn't know why, so you start going through the troubleshooting steps. Had a handheld right next to the radio, have the antenna mounted to the cage uh, on the back of the razor. Everything was working, and if I clicked the button to transmit, I could hear the speakers in my, in my shop actually buzzing because of the 20 watts being projected out of that antenna. Uh, everything seemed to be working as it was supposed to, but I wasn't getting any recognition of audio from the, the handset. And what it ended up being, was that the handset's connection is fairly loose. Um, and I have a video on our website uh, in the review that shows that this jack doesn't make a good connection um, pretty much at any point. This jack, while it's a good jack, the RJ45 is used in every computer network in the world. It's established connection, but the implementation on this radio is pretty poor. There's an actual um, nearly quarter inch gap between the plug boot and the radio unit that it can play in and out of. And so to test that um, on the video that I mentioned, uh, I just put it on the FM receiver mode uh, to listen to a local radio station and I demonstrate the audio cutting in and out. Uh, it pretty much effectively made this unit completely useless at that point because you could not use the handheld to transmit, receive, dial in frequencies or channels, anything like that. Knowing that the system was going to be primarily operated with headsets or in helmet systems, uh, I moved on because that's not crucial at that point. It's just a nice feature to have this available when you're outside the car. Moved on to the NNT 10. Now, the first thing you expect to do is utilize the two front jacks, plug in your headset and check it out. I plugged in both headsets into both driver and co-driver and started playing with the Vox frequency and volume. Um, nothing really happened. So I plugged my iPhone into it, into the music input on the 3.5 using my lightning adapter. Um, and I did not get any audio out of the headset and I figured, well, it must be a volume thing. It must be something and nothing happened. I knew something was up. So I started going through it. I thought maybe the radio had to be on or off or I didn't plug it in right or wire it right or something, but I confirmed everything and it still didn't work. So I had no car to car or in car communications. I had no uh, music coming through and uh, pushing the push to talk on the headset didn't trigger the radio. So obviously that means that the connection between the headset and the unit was not working correctly. So at that point I popped the unit out and I plugged it into the back where you have your driver, co-driver, passengers, uh, jacks on the back. And at that point the headset started working. So that made me curious why the front jacks didn't work versus the back. I can see where if you have a four seater, you're going to wire everything into the head unit, run it through the panels and make it easy to connect for all four passengers of the car. For a two seater or somebody that doesn't want to run new chases for the front two seat uh, options, they're probably going to be looking at using those front jacks, whether that be directly from the headset cable or with an extension or whatever. So I took the NTT, the NNT 10 out of the, the mount, took it to the bench, took it apart, and I found that these two front jacks aren't even physically connected to the PC board within the unit. There's, there, matter of fact, there's no actual connections for those jacks to be physically connected to. There are two jacks on the PC board for the rear, and theoretically, those would work in those ports, and you could relocate that 
but the way this is designed, it wouldn't work without rewiring those jacks. No reasonable consumer is expected to rewire and remount the jacks of a product that they just bought brand new. I find that to be a huge, huge failure point on that product. If you have jacks, they should work. I moved on to testing the unit with the headsets connected to the back. So then your next step is to check communications between headsets, front driver and co-driver. And to do that, because you're using your push to talk to communicate over the car to car comms, you have to rely on the Vox sensitivity to automatically pass your audio back and forth. So to do that, what you do is you start by talking to each other by raising the Vox uh, sensitivity knob until it gets to a point where your audio of speaking is higher than that threshold and it opens that gate of audio allowing you to hear each other. As soon as you're done talking, it then closes down. There was only one setting on this, on this unit, about two o'clock, three o'clock, somewhere in there, where it actually did that function. Before that setting, it just wouldn't work. I'd have to yell to even get it to work at 12 o'clock, one o'clock. At 2, 2.30, it would start to do the function that it was expected and the music that was playing would fade down and the Vox would come up. And that's awesome. That's exactly how I expect it to work. Um, but if you go any higher than that, which would be representative of if the car's in motion, you're hearing the motor whine, the wind noise, all that stuff, uh, it would just stay open. And basically, Vox is a requirement of this configuration, a car to car radio with in car comms. You have to rely on the Vox, unless you run a push the talk button to the back. If it just stays closed, you have to yell at your partner, which is pointless of the headset because then you could just yell at the partner. If you go past that and it just stays open, then it bypasses the whole point of having a Vox system. So, that was really frustrating, especially after all the other issues I had encountered. And at that point, you know, basically I would have to rely on a push to talk button. So you would have to run a trigger to the steering wheel, one to the T bar, you know, one to the passengers, whatever the case may be. So at the end of the day, what you basically have is a communication system where the handheld uh, interface doesn't work. The connection between the radio and the intercom is a cumbersome analog connection that's not weather tight. You have a Vox system that doesn't work. You have two jacks that don't work. And you have to then, you're forced to rewire your car if that wasn't what you wanted to do. So already uh, there was a lot of friction here with this unit. Then I was moving into testing the radio comms. So the weather around here and the timing of this review and everything that kind of just all came together didn't really allow us to do really great testing out in the mountains or, you know, on the trail, things like that. But I did get a chance to test, you know, the handhelds and the, and the radio on the Razor within, you know, a mile range of, of where we live. That part worked fine. The audio came through clear, the handheld reception, transmission on both units. Uh, everything actually worked really well. You could hear each other well, and I would say was par for the course of other options on the market. Um, like I said, the headset does really sound very good for vocal representation, and the handheld does get very loud, and the screen is bright and visible in the daylight. Um, a lot of good things working for, for the radios. Um, but then I got to the programming side where I encountered a lot of issues. Going through the menu system and trying things out, changing things like squelch and you know different VHF settings and UHF uh, tones and, and all sorts of different stuff. A lot of times you get to a point where you change something, you know, four or five menus deep, and you want to, you don't know what screwed you up and you want to start over. So there's a factory reset option on these radios, both the head unit, the handhelds, uh, pretty much any radio that you receive. There's a factory reset. I got to a point where I was like, I, I, it's just way easier to factory reset. And it would be kind of like normal for a customer out, in the, out on the dunes or in the trails or whatever. They've been poking around with it. Their kids did something stupid, whatever. They have to do a factory reset. I did a factory reset and all of a sudden it restarted, which is expected. The Nav Atlas logo pops up. It goes away and it goes to the home screen, which is your two bands of radio reception monitoring. Once it got to that point, 
all of the saved channel names, all this, the saved channel frequencies were gone. At that point, I lost all the ability to operate the radio out of the FCC regulated ranges and I lost all of the license frequencies that I received when I bought as a consumer if I were to buy the radio that I would have bought. So what that means is if you're out on the trail or out in the desert or whatever and you're monitoring a race team or you're talking with your buddies on Checkers 2 and your buddies are on BFG Relay and you know whatever the case may be, um, if you had done that in the field, you would have lost all the options to um, communicate over those frequencies. You could observe them if you knew what the actual um, you know, frequency was and you could dial it in, but you wouldn't be able to transmit audio. You wouldn't be able to call out on that band, nor would you have the license to because it wasn't no longer provided in the radio. So that being said, I thought that because it uses the standard two pin communication port, I could connect this to my computer, open up the Chirp software, download the program from the NHR1, reload it onto this radio, you know, map it over, or even recreate it manually if I had to. I have all the frequencies for the competitors, I could put them into the radio. There's no, there's no compatibility with this radio with the Chirp software. There's not a profile for them. So I wasn't able to do that. So then my next question was, does the handheld have the same problem? And sure enough, the handset, when you do a factory reset, loses all its saved frequencies. The Nav Atlas logo is still there, it still boots up, but you've lost all the licensed bands that you paid for. When you buy a radio system like this, you are buying the license to operate that radio on those frequencies. The FCC is very stringent on what you can and can't do. So first of all, you have to have your radio operator's license. If you don't have that, technically speaking, you're not supposed to use these. You're not even supposed to use the handhelds. If you don't have the factory provided programming with those um, special license frequencies in the radio, you're not legally allowed to transmit unless you yourself have submitted a bid and a, an application to, and has been authorized to broadcast on those frequencies. If you do a factory reset, you lose those options. That's a huge problem for me. If you're buying a product and you do a factory reset, it should go back to the way you bought it, the way you received it in the box. These radios are made by a company called Kydera. Uh, these are you know, white labeled radios. And that's the same thing that happens with all the brands in the radio industry. Uh, there's various other brands out there that do the exact same thing with variable levels of uh, transparency on that, but that's really not a problem. I have nothing against that. That's actually how business in the radio world works. Like there's only a handful of factories that make radio chips and make radios. You can't just do that yourself. It's way too expensive. But ultimately speaking, they bought these radios to then label as theirs. They put the programming, they had they submitted the license for the, the broadcast rights and, and all that stuff, which is all perfectly fine, but the radio should never factory reset to before that process happened. If the process of factory resetting this goes beyond the manufacturer that sold it to you, this is a product that is now susceptible to losing all of its value in that sense. And I don't agree with that. These radios should have baked in from the factory that you bought it from those programming and licensings. And you know, no one's perfect, I get it, like things happen, but ultimately what it comes down to this whole, this whole ecosystem here is just too burdened with flaws and issues that are baked into the product that I can't recommend them. I've never had a product come into the, my shop where I was setting up to do a review where I didn't know if it was gonna be good or not. I have a good procedure to weed out bad products and bad companies, and I'm not saying Nav Atlas is a bad company. They can be a very well uh, established company, great people, I, I, I honestly, don't have that personal connection. But the product should not require you to not touch the red button, so to speak. The product should be what it is out of the box no matter what you do to it. And especially in radios, the FCC is very stringent on if you're gonna sell this product, it has to have these requirements. And all that money that you put into the system to buy those licenses, go into thin air as soon as you hit that factory reset. 
So if you don't do a factory reset, it is possible that this unit might be okay for you to use. It might be possible that this jack is perfectly fine for you. It might be possible that the Vox sensitivity works great for you. It might be possible that your unit has a different revision PC board and those front jacks are plugged in. The problem is we won't know until you buy it and try it. The samples that I were sent were new in the package. I opened up everything out of the boxes. I installed them all myself. I know exactly the process that happened and the products themselves did not live up to the expectations. And I was completely taken back by that. I was totally stoked to have this system in the Razer for the next year or so while we tested it, gave feedback, promoted it, all those different things. But as it stands in this revision of all these different products, I can't recommend them. The issues with programming, jacks not working, glass blade uh, fuses instead of blade fuses, uh, they're, the handhelds uh, essentially basically were unusable at an off-road event where the sand got into the push the talk button almost instantly and it never was dropped in the sand. There's a lot to like about this. It's very common to see setups like this in our industry now, but there's really nothing here that worked correctly 100% outside of the headsets. So at this time, with this revision, with these components, I can't really recommend this product. And I'm unfortunately having to say that. I don't wanna say that. I wanna recommend good products and new companies and competitions within our industry. And in the radio market, there's really not a lot of competition. And I was hoping to see more competition here and more value added products and more budget conscious products and maybe see this company grow to be a big competitor and a big supporter of our industry. But that's not what we're seeing. And so unfortunately, this kit, these products have flaws. I've pointed them out in detail on our website. So visit our website at sidebysideguys.com to see all of the details. But as an overview, you kind of get the gist of what's going on, why I don't like it. And unfortunately, this kit is not gonna be in the Razor. So uh, check them out online. Their website's a little goofy. Uh, they don't have a lot of details. They don't have a lot of uh, specifics for you. Um, but you can see all the products they offer. You can see these units, the different Can-Am mounts and, and various components that they have. They have some interesting other accessories like uh, camera mirrors and things like that. But uh, at this point, I'm going to reserve uh, our spot on the Razer for radio comms uh, to maybe a different product that comes down the pipe. So um, they're at a lot of events down south. Uh, you might be able to see them in person at one of the shows. Um, stop by, check out their products, talk to them, see if they have any revisions coming down the line. Um, because at the end of the day, this unit is no good. Until the next time, guys, peace. Time, time.